Are you ready for another round of scary work stories? Today I've got 18 of them, just for you. Remember, this is actually a compilation of my other podcast, Tales from the Break Room, which is a show where I narrate people's true and scary workplace horror stories. Please rate and follow Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts to support us. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Can you believe how hot it is lately? It's pointless to shower these days. I get out, dry off, and in two minutes I'm drenched in milk anyway. Oh, wait, I never told you I sweat milk, did I? Yeah, I'm starting to think that's why all those stray cats keep showing up when I check the mail in the morning. Anyway, welcome back to Dead and Roasted. You're just in time for another delicious break. You don't want to miss today's stories. There will be the most disturbing ghosts you've ever heard of, and a tragic accident that will make your jaw hurt. Enjoy these tales from the break room. It stared at me from the dark, from days and dust. I work for a three-floor house museum that is rumored to be haunted by some of the former residents, a belief that I myself now share. I had seen some things before around the house, white wisps darting into rooms, the sounds of voices or walking on the floors I wasn't on. Hell, I've even had my bag tugged by some unseen force. I tend to embrace whatever our spirits here give me. It's silly, but when I'm alone, I do talk to them. I see them as friends, sometimes even colleagues. None of my experiences ever bothered me, as much as the encounter I'm about to share with you. Even now, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It was a Friday, and we had a paranormal investigation group come to walk around the museum for a few hours. Nothing too out of the ordinary. We've been having groups come in for the past year, usually recurring groups, but this group was new. There were four of them, and they were really nice. They even took me along, giving me a camera to hold, explaining things as they went along, so that I could understand. It was pretty cool to be honest, and it made me feel like I was an actual investigator. There were five of us going through the house, and for the most part, all we really got were a couple of voices. The spirit box did go off quite a few times, but nothing too overly exciting. This wasn't beyond the usual. A lot of the evidence other groups tended to get were voices. But you could tell these guys were a little disappointed. After a few hours, we headed up to the third floor to investigate there. The lead investigator, Dave, asked me if I could shut off all the lights. He explained they wanted to do an experiment. He wanted us to sit in the dark and see, once our eyes were adjusted, if we could get anything to interact with us. I obliged in excitement, turning off every light and soon joining them upstairs in one of the kids' bedrooms. It was a pretty fun thought, getting to interact with some of the ghosts here. Now, the doorway I sat in front of was connected to two hallways, the first, if you went straight out of the room, would lead to a couple of other rooms, and to the main stairs at the end. The other hallway to the left went down a wall of paintings and photographs, towards the servant's staircase and another bedroom. All the window shutters were closed on this floor, so it was pitch black. The only light was the occasional flicker of the fire alarm that would briefly light up the ceiling of the hallway. Sitting in the doorway, I stared down the hallway in front of me, the one going towards the main staircase, and for five or so minutes I sat there in darkness. Eventually, someone from the group behind me started to comment on seeing a woman in white down the hallway, something that I just didn't see. I started to get annoyed after a while, thinking they were just messing with me. After a few moments though, after squinting in the dark in front of me, I feel the sudden overwhelming urge that I'm being watched. I turn my head briefly towards the hallway to my left, and I stare there for a moment, seeing nothing but inky blackness. I went to move my head, thinking I was fooling myself, when I realized something. I watched as the fire alarm light blinked, and instead of seeing the portraits on the wall, all I see is a giant black mass. 
My stomach dropped when I saw it, especially at how massive this shadow seemed to be. The ceiling on this floor is about 10 feet tall, so this shadow had to be at least 7 or 8 feet tall. It barely reached the top of our painting exhibit racks, which are a little over 8 feet tall, I think. It stood maybe 5 feet away from me, just staring. I couldn't see any features of it, but I could just feel its eyes on me. I whispered to Dave that there was something in that hallway, but he and his crew were too busy whispering behind me about the lady they were seeing. One of the investigators closest to me, Mary, soon grew very quiet. I don't know if she saw what I saw, or just got sick of sitting in the dark, but she quickly flicked on her flashlight and announced that they were going to take a break. I turned mine on as well and shone it down that hallway, but there was nothing. I told the group about the thing in the hallway, and in excitement, Dave said that I should try communicating with it this time if it returned. They turned the lights out again, and after 10 minutes, I started to feel that sensation once more. But this time, the blackness was only a few feet away. Once again, I couldn't make out any features. This time, however, it was close enough that I was sure I could clearly see the large shadow in the darkness. At the prodding of Dave earlier, I'd hesitantly sat down this time with my legs outstretched one towards where the shadow now stood. I asked it to touch my ankle in a shaky voice, starting to lose my cool as I watched it move towards me. I could make out what looked to be a large hand with long fingers coming from the mass. I could feel the cold as it had started to move towards my ankle. It was slow, agonizingly slow, as if it were in slow motion. This time though, I think Dave saw it too. Just before the shadow could grab my ankle, he quickly turned on his flashlight and announced that the experiment was over. That was that. We turned on the lights and explored for a bit longer in the light until the investigation was done. I still work at that museum, and I haven't seen the form since then. Dave said that sometimes ghosts try to take on bigger and scarier looking forms to intimidate the living while some of the other investigators claim that it might have been a shadow person. I, personally, don't know what it was, or what its intentions were at all. I go to that part of the house quite regularly, with tours, and I've never witnessed anything like it during the day. I wonder if it was trying to communicate with me that night, or if it was just curious as to why a living person was there that late at night to begin with. Whatever it was. I still do feel its stare sometimes when I'm alone. It used to be only on the third floor, but now it seems to have followed me to my office on the second floor. I always find myself looking up towards the stairs when I get that feeling, but I never see anything. If anyone has any ideas on what this could be, let me know. I'm open to any ideas, but to be honest, I'm not sure if I want to see it again. But maybe my curiosity is getting the better of me. All I do know is that the day I see an 8-foot tall shadow mass in the middle of the day, that's the day I'm quitting. Ghost at Chuck E. Cheese From Jazzy J I graduated from a Christian school and I was 18, so I needed a job to pay for college. One of the seniors I graduated with recommended I work at Chuck E. Cheese, which is where he worked. I was accepted pretty quickly and just as quickly I realized how stressful the job was. I worked as a game room attendant. I was the one that customers called for when they needed tokens, cleaned tables, delivered pizzas, and helped little kids find their mom or dad. It was fine at first when I had help, but as soon as I began to settle in, I was the only game room attendant for the closing shift. During the closing shift, half of the restaurant is already turned off. The games are as well. Except one, The Haunted Mansion. I was told about that game, that it would sometimes turn on during the night while being connected to no power. I paid that no mind, I didn't want to assume the worst. Being part of a family that was raised Christian, I was taught to ignore the paranormal as to not catch any attention from it. During one shift, I was the only one in the game room area, cleaning the tables near the cashier, where the last lights were on. 
did you turn off the games? One of the girl cashiers, D, asked. I turned to her, then back at the darkness and scanned the area. The games are all connected to one power source, I explained. If one's on, all of them are going to be on. Well, I swear I saw a light flashing or something. Maybe it was just a car passing by. She calmed herself as she continued her mopping. Another female cashier, A, grinned as she came over. Maybe it was Angie's ghost. At this, D flinched and glared at her. Don't say that. I watched them for a bit, confused about this Angie's ghost. But I decided not to bother and went on with my duties. At Chuck E. Cheese, every employee must be Chuck E. This is done every hour or so of the day. A small broom closet is where employees went to change into the costume. The inside of it smelled really bad. And in the closet, there was a door at the back wall which was locked. You could peek in through the top, since the small wooden door was shorter than the actual frame. But it was dark and you could see the sunlight from the other door also peeking in on the other side. This is where it began to get weird. I dreaded going into that closet. It wasn't just because the costume smelled like vomit, but the darkness in that room behind the closet never felt, well, empty. Every time I changed, I felt someone staring at me, shooting daggers at my back as I put on the costume, and I never dared to look back, because when I did, there would be nothing but a small silhouette of a head showing up to break the light coming from the other door. But I knew no one was there, which terrified me more as I tried to ignore it. While closing, I was always the last one to leave, along with my manager who just stayed in the office. But I was the only one outside, alone in the darkness. I would always put on my headphones, listening to music as I cleaned, but I could never have both of them in. I always had just one earbud in, because every time I put in both, the feeling of being watched enveloped me, and even worse, it felt as if someone was always walking up to me. The bathrooms were taken care of by the cashiers. I never went to the restroom because I was always needed by a customer or by my manager. But one opening shift made me 100% sure that what I was feeling and sensing was not in my head and I would never use that restroom ever again. On the day of that opening shift, there was a blackout. We had to sit out in the front tables near the windows, so as not to trip in the semi-darkness of the building. My female manager kept saying she wanted to go into the dark office for the phone, to call and see what's going on. Don't do it, or else Angie's ghost will get you. A would call out to her as the manager ran into the darkness, that's when I decided to ask her about it. Who is Angie? What ghost? A looked over at me with a wide expression. You haven't felt it. There's a ghost here. It was brought here by an old employee named Angie. The cook looked over with fear and shushed her. Shh, don't talk about her. I've had enough of her. One time I walked out to take out the trash, and when I turned to look back at the door, there was a flash of black hair... Then a hand grabbed the door and shut it. It was locked, too. He exclaimed. I had to run to the front and have Dee unlock the door to let me in, and we checked the cameras. Nothing but static. Soon, the lights to the building turned back on. Everyone returned to their normal places. But I had a bad feeling in my chest after that story. I felt like something was going to happen. I just didn't know what and the feeling of being watched wasn't helping at all. And, to my horror, I needed to use the restroom. After a long time hesitating, I went. I didn't like the restroom there. It felt off, and the cashiers would tell me strange things happened in the girls' restroom. I ran in, and I took the last stall out of the four. The feeling of being watched was even worse. I felt my heart pounding out of my chest as I finished up. Once I was done, I went towards the sink to wash my hands, but as I approached the sink, I noticed the first stall, which was closed when I walked in, was now wide open, and there was someone inside. There was a little girl, with long, black hair covering her face. She was in a white dress, 
My skin crawled as I saw her. As ashamed as I am to say this, I was so afraid I left without washing my hands. I didn't want to be in that restroom any longer. And before anyone tries to debunk this, we hadn't opened to anyone yet, so it wasn't a customer. And the only girls there at the time were me, A, and the manager, who were at the front counting the registers for the day. So I knew at that moment that was Angie's ghost, the one I'd heard so much about, and she did not like me. I told my parents about this, and immediately they told me to ignore it. They told me to pray before I walked into work and to listen to Christian music while I cleaned. Once I began doing this, I would feel a bubble surrounding me, like a shield, and I would still feel her watching me from a distance, even walking around the bubble, looking for a way to get closer to me. But she never could, and for a while, I stopped feeling her near me. On my last week of working there, we had a full house. I was so busy stocking tickets and tokens that I had to be pulled aside by a dad needing some assistance with a particular photo booth. This photo booth was a little red car with Chucky sitting in the passenger seat, and the driver's seat is where the kids would sit and take their pictures. Once a picture was taken, it would print out on the side of the engine of the car. So yeah, our pictures aren't coming out. Could you help us? The dad asked me. I quickly followed the dad to the machine. His little girl had blonde hair and two pigtails with a bright yellow dress. I said hello before kneeling down to the printer part of the booth. Once I opened it up, I saw her photo stuck inside. I pulled it out, but I could feel that there were more photos jammed up behind it. I assumed they were also hers and handed the three photos to the dad. I started closing up the machine when the dad spoke again. Hey, uh, these pictures aren't my daughter's. I looked up at him as he handed me two photos back. The first one's mine, but the last two aren't. They look kind of creepy, don't they? He said. I looked at the photos, and my eyes watered. There, sitting at the driver's seat, where the camera takes the picture, was a little girl with black hair covering her eyes, wearing a white dress. The second photo was her holding the camera with skinny, pale arms. When I looked back up, the dad and his daughter were already at another game. I took the photos and ran to the kitchen to show the cook. Look, is this her? I yelled, rushing over to him and explaining everything that happened. His face went white. He nodded with wide eyes. He quickly showed the female manager, exclaiming that he was indeed telling her the truth. Once everyone took a look at those photos, we placed them in the small break room, which was just a small shelf and under it were hooks for people's bags and purses. I continued my duties for the night while telling my friend who guards the front entrance about the whole situation. She didn't get to see the photos and wanted to see them herself. I quickly went to the break room to obtain them, but to my surprise, the pictures were not there. Hey, did you take the photos? I asked the cook. He turned to me and shook his head. No, why? Well, I wanted to show them to my friend, but they're not there. Did someone go into the break room and get them? I asked again. Everyone looked around the whole kitchen. No one ever saw those photos again. They were just gone. I've never had an experience like this, and I hope it's the last. To that ghost, I hope we never meet again. Spark and I saw hell. From Matthew. I live on the border of Virginia and West Virginia. It's a beautiful place here in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I started working for a tree clearing service. We had to go up to West Virginia and clear out a hillside for a gas line they were installing. We got up there and got to work. There were houses close to this hillside. After laying down a few trees, we got to one we were worried might hit a house, so we decided to use a cool called a come-along to pull it in the direction we wanted it to fall. We hooked up two of them to two different trees, running ropes up to the tree. I had never done this before, so all I was told was when it fell loose in my hands to step back from the come-along. My rope was run through another tree, 
As I started to crank, the man in the bucket truck began to cut the tree, and when I felt it get loose, I stepped back. Well, with that rope through the other tree, when the tree fell, it yanked that come along up in the air and it hit me right in my jaw. It threw me about five feet in the air and I came down on my head. I was severely dazed. It took me a minute to get control of my body again. I had a severe concussion. Finally, when I sat up, I could tell half my face had been crushed in and I was severely bleeding. I stayed calm but the other guys around me began to panic. They had never been in a situation like this. I just kept saying I needed to get to the hospital as I kept spitting out blood. Finally, I got the boss to take me down to the hospital after he found a towel so I didn't get blood all over the truck. We made it to the hospital and I was immediately taken in, every doctor and nurse working on me. I had them call my girlfriend because she was the closest to the hospital. When she made it there, I was barely hanging on because of all the blood loss. I had cut an artery in my face, and my jaw had been completely shattered. They were going to med flight me out and put me under to slow the blood loss. Then my girlfriend asked how long I would be asleep for, maybe just a few hours? The doctor replied, probably a few days. That's when I started freaking out, truly realizing how close to death I was, but they put me under and they put me on a ventilator. They med flighted me out to Roanoke for emergency surgery to stop the bleeding. During that time, I had an out-of-body experience. I remember seeing nothing but complete darkness. I tried to move, but I couldn't. It felt as if every nerve in my body was on fire. Then I noticed the sounds. They were truly horrifying. The pain, the torture, the endless suffering I heard around me was like nothing Hollywood has ever come up with. Then I felt this presence coming towards me. I could feel the hate and maliciousness coming from it. I just wanted to run, but I couldn't do a thing. I began to think this was my fate, that in life I had been a terrible person, and I began to ask for forgiveness. As I did that, a beautiful white light started to shine in front of me. In that light stood a man. I couldn't see his face, but I could see he was wearing white clothes. He reached out his hand towards me, and with everything in me, I reached out for his hand, grabbing it. At the same time, something grabbed my ankle. That's when I woke back up, still hooked to everything, still on the ventilator. My girlfriend was in the room. She was so happy to see my eyes open, to know that I was going to make it. The hospital staff were freaking out, afraid I was going to start pulling things out of me. I was just happy to be alive, to be honest. They put me back under and did the second surgery to restructure my jaw. I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and had a while to recover, but I can only say the place I saw was down under, and I was saved by a righteous man. After these events, I seem to have more abnormal things happen to me, and to this day, I'm just happy I didn't stay in that place. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Oh, jeez, you scared me. I didn't see you walk in. Sorry about that. You see, I was just enjoying my break when the lights started to flicker. Then my mind drifted to one of the scariest work stories I can remember. Here, have a seat. I'll share that story with you. A story about a furnace repair turned nightmare. Plus, I've got a few more featuring killer employees and life-ruining customers. By the way, if the lights do go out again, would you mind going to the basement to check the breakers? Just ignore the strange noise that sounds like a dozen people breathing at the same time. They're never there when the light is on, so uh, nothing to worry about. These are Tales from the Break Room. Service Call I'll Never Forget From Sleepy HVAC Guy This happened to me around six to seven years ago. And when I think about it, it feels like it just happened yesterday. I'll never forget that day. I'm an HVAC service technician, 
and for those who don't know, it's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. It's good trade work. With this kind of work, if you do residential housing, it isn't uncommon for homeowners to leave the door unlocked for you to go fix whatever isn't working when they're not home during the day. At least, that's how it is in the smaller town I live in. I received a work order one day to schedule a visit with an older lady for a furnace checkup. Usually, they request service and I call to set up a time and date to come do the work. So I did just that. I called, and she asked if I could come the next morning at 8. I agreed, and she said, I'll leave the back door unlocked. Just let yourself in. The stairs are right at the back door. Just head down them, and the first door on your right is where the furnace is. I replied, Sounds good. I'll let you know if I find any issues. She then spoke back, That sounds wonderful, thank you. Also, I haven't decided if I'm going to sleep in tomorrow or going to work early. I'm leaving for a vacation. A vacation? Sounds like fun. Well, I'll try to be quiet when I come in so I don't wake you if you're sleeping in then. She thanked me, and we said our goodbyes. The next morning, I was up at the usual time, making myself some coffee, then jumping into the truck, going on my way. It was a cool fall day, and the morning was darkened with rain clouds. My favorite weather. I pulled up to the house in the work order. It was a small white home, older for sure, with red shutters and a tall seven-foot white wooden fence around the back of the property. I grabbed my bag out of the back. Sipping my coffee, I started walking to the side of the house to the gate. I let myself in and walked up the stairs to the back door. I glanced over to her detached garage, and through the window I saw a vehicle parked inside. I looked inside quickly to see if there were any signs of the homeowner. It was dark inside, all the lights were off. So I opened the door, went inside, and closed it behind me. In this house, when you walk into the back door, the stairs are straight ahead, and to the right it opens up into a kitchen. Well, I peeked around the right side and looked down past the kitchen into the living room. I thought to myself, she must be asleep still, hence the vehicle and the lights being off. I turned the basement stair lights on and went down the stairs to the furnace room. I unpacked my bag for the tools I needed and began to open the furnace up to run it and test the things I needed to. We use a little plastic key to close the furnace switch so the fan will run while the door is off. It makes some noise, but it usually isn't too loud while it runs. A few seconds after the furnace started, my ears perked up. I heard something above me. Footsteps. They were coming from where the bedrooms would be, off to my right walking over me to the kitchen. I didn't think much of it. I just felt bad I may have been making too much noise and woke up our customer. A few moments went by and I heard the footsteps go back to the bedroom. I was getting close to the end of what I needed to do there, when all of a sudden, I heard a thud, thud, thud. I nearly jumped up from my crouched position. What the hell was that? I thought to myself. It was stomping. Someone was stomping from the bedroom to the kitchen. I felt some slight panic, because I thought I kept her awake with the noise, and she was upset with me. The stomping stopped briefly in the kitchen above me and I just stared at the floor above me waiting. The few moments I waited felt like an eternity then. Thud, thud, thud. The stomping footsteps trailed back away to the bedroom. I remembered thinking, I better pack up and split before I have an uncomfortable confrontation with the homeowner. I put the covers back on the furnace, threw my tools in my bag, and my phone in my pocket. I stood up, taking a few steps and looking around the corner. I saw the light to the stairs was off. I paused a moment before walking out of the room and thought to myself, I'm pretty sure I turned that on. But before I could contemplate any more to myself, thud, thud, thud. The footsteps were even louder than before, like someone was running from one end of the house to the other and stopped right above me. I started to get some anxiety knowing someone was there, waiting. It felt as if I waited an eternity to hear something, anything. So I took a deep breath 
and I thought, well, if she's angry, I'll just have to deal with it and be extra nice. I took a few steps. I was looking down at the floor then, and I could see the bottom of the steps from there. I peered up, and in the darkness of the stairs at the top was the silhouette of a head of someone with long hair dangling down over their face and shoulders. What little light from the door there was behind the head cast a shadow over their face. I couldn't make out any features. It was just an arm and head, like someone was leaning around the corner looking down at me. Panic set in. I froze. I locked eyes on this person for what felt like forever. Eventually, I had to blink. And when I did, they vanished. I blinked a few more times and tried to clear my eyes. I waited and prayed they would go back the other way so I could just leave. I wondered what in the world was that about. A few seconds passed, and the footsteps thudded back to the bedroom. Dead silence fell over the house. All I could hear was the blood pumping and ringing in my ears. Finally, I decided to push myself and just go. My legs felt they were made of solid metal, stiff and heavy. I then broke into a sprint up the stairs. My spine chilled as I ran. My ears heard them coming. Thud, thud, thud. It was coming towards me. Full adrenaline was pumping now. I charged up the stairs, pushing myself. I got to the top, and as I opened the door and slammed it behind me, I saw a shadow out of the corner of my eye. I tried to catch my breath. I turned around, and through the small glass opening at the top of the door, I saw a shadow of a person standing in the kitchen. I didn't freeze this time. I nearly fell down the steps getting away. I went down the path through the gate, back to my truck. I threw my bag in the back, and I jumped in. I tried to make sense of what just happened. My heart was beating out of my chest. Trying to calm myself down, I put it in drive and was gone. I drove a few blocks up to a gas station to get a fresh coffee, trying to relax before calling the homeowner. I calmed myself first, then made the call. Here's how the conversation went. Uh, hello? I I'm all finished. Everything looks good. I I'm sorry if I woke you up. Oh, no worries. You didn't wake me. I went into work early. Oh, I see. I saw a car in the garage. I thought I heard some footsteps above me, too. Must have been my mind playing tricks. She paused a moment before responding, then said, Oh, yes, my house is old. It can make some funny noises. I rode with a co-worker today. Oh, I see. Well, I'll see you in the spring for that maintenance. Her response came quickly, and she cut me off at the end of my sentence, simply asking, Did you see it? The Soldier's Morgue From Jubilee The place where I used to work had briefly been a soldier's morgue during World War II. Situated on the northern beaches in Sydney, Australia, it was at a logical site for the purpose. It was down the road from the former cottage hospital, close to the historic colonial-style church in the house that once belonged to the local bishop. There's still a funeral home in the area, just a few blocks away. During World War II, the thousands of returned servicemen needing urgent care overwhelmed the small hospital. Nearby houses were used as a temporary hospice, somewhere to shelter the mortally wounded. When the soldiers passed away, the basement was made into a makeshift morgue, with the deceased ferried across the water to the quarantine station. After World War II, the place had been a popular sports and recreational club, catering to returned servicemen, their families, and friends. Then it had been left unoccupied, until it was converted into a suite of offices. The original sandstone level of the building was clearly visible from the sloping street. It set below the newer floor made of terracotta brick. There was a small bronze plaque on the side of the building that said, The Soldier's Wing. Another plaque referred to it as The Soldier's Memorial Hall. 
We were the first people to occupy the building in years. Irma, the supervisor who told me about the morgue, often came to work early in the morning. Sometimes, she heard noises from downstairs, uncannily like a household going about its daily routine, with people moving around and the murmur of conversation. But Irma was never tempted to leave her desk and investigate. She was content to let things be, as long as she was left alone. Irma thought that she could have heard residual echoes, imprints of activities, or events from the past when it used to be a club. She was sensitive to nuances, having her own share of odd experiences. Perhaps this was why she could sense things that most people could not. The floor below was where the soldiers' morgue had been located. When the place was a club, it had been the cold room where they stored beer kegs. Next to the cold room was the meeting room, which was strangely cold, even when it was full of people, or during the heat of summer. Another of my colleagues would avoid the meeting room and the facilities on the floor. It was nothing she could properly explain to us. It was just this unreasoning fear she got whenever she was down there. The ladies' room on the upper floor was even chillier, despite the general heating in the place. Whenever I had to use the facilities, I told myself it was just an old building with cracks and vents everywhere. But now I wonder if there could be something else to it. Perhaps the disruption from renovations could have stirred up things that should have been left in peace. The busy stream of people moving into the place, followed by the daily hubbub of a large office, was not particularly restful. Maybe someone, or something, did not like all that activity. Within five months after it became an office, the place became very unsettled. Everyone was unhappy. Some people were overreacting to situations where no offense was intended. Others were finding fault with everyone and everything over minor situations. The atmosphere became thoroughly uncomfortable, with ill feelings and poisonous barbs flying everywhere. I was coming home exhausted from such a toxic environment. There were days I would feel it was like pushing through sticky cobwebs when walking past these unhappy people, or that my feet were trudging through thick mud. But when they were not in the office, everything seemed much lighter and brighter. Eventually, the negativity became overwhelming. The resultant stress began to affect my health. It was clear I had to leave. On the afternoon before I left, I went downstairs to take a few photos of the place as a keepsake. But first, I took precautions. I said a quick prayer, asking for protection and the help of whichever guardian spirit was around. All went well at first. I took a few photos without problems. The entire floor was rather dim even though it was well lit and sunlight was shining outside the large windows. Then, my camera phone would not respond when I pressed the button. When I got it going again, the autofocus would not function, and several pictures turned out blurry. I deleted the photos that came out too fuzzy. Now that in itself was odd, because I'd kept my hand steady the entire time. The flash didn't come on even though the place had grown somehow darker. Odd that the places still looked brighter in the photos. Then I heard something fall over in the lounge area with a clatter. And just like that, I didn't feel alone any longer. The hairs on the nape of my neck were prickling in alarm. I had the distinct impression there were groups of people here and there, around the sofas. All seemed to be looking curiously at me and my camera phone. Doing my best to keep calm, I said politely, I'm leaving tomorrow and I wanted some photos for the memories. I wish you all well and to be at peace. I had no idea whom I was talking to, but I had the distinct urge to get out of there in a hurry, which I did. When I showed the photos to a few colleagues and friends, most of them saw nothing out of the ordinary. It really surprised me when a few friends saw shadows in the photos, where there shouldn't have been any one of them was a man who came from a family with unusual abilities. He said there was the faint image of a man sitting near the bottom step of the staircase, his head bowed, smoking. There was also a number of people standing around the lounge area near the windows. The sound of something falling that I'd heard were files that had been stacked on a nearby chair. 
Now that I no longer work at the place, I feel very relieved. That whole building was just weird. My Mom's Old Employee From Anonymous This story happened a long time ago, so I'm sorry if it's lacking any detail. I don't exactly remember everything about that night. Well, you see, I used to live in a small town in northern Alaska. It was quite remote and isolated. You could only get there by plane or by boat. We were in the tundra too, so it was extremely cold. My mom and I moved here because she got a job offer to be a director of nursing at the hospital, and they were offering to pay a lot because she would have to move out there. We moved into an apartment building in town which was pretty small compared to normal towns, but it was the best place we could get where we were. After living there for a couple of weeks, I noticed that our neighbors underneath us started fighting a lot and throwing things. We would frequently hear people slamming doors and leaving in their truck after an argument. At the time, I didn't know what to think of it. My mom didn't tell me a lot about what was going on because she wanted to protect me and didn't want me to feel scared. Fast forward a few months and my friends and I were having a sleepover while my mother went in to work an overnight to cover for her staff. It was almost 2 a.m. when I heard someone coming up the steps outside. My friends and I froze because no one would be coming up except my mother and she wasn't supposed to be home until 7. We had these giant windows looking right out to the stairs so I could clearly see him. Luckily, we had the lights off so he couldn't see in. We turned off the TV and waited. We then saw a tall man walking up to the door. He knocked very aggressively. He was wearing all black and I could barely make out his face, but I recognized him to be our downstairs neighbor. I didn't know why he was here. We never talked to those neighbors. I felt like it was a bad idea to answer, so my friends hid in my room and I hid underneath the windowsill so he couldn't see me. I was hoping he would walk away, but he came up to the window and began banging on it too, aggressively. I was getting super freaked out at this point, and I wanted to call my mom or the cops, but I was too scared to move. It felt like he was banging on the window for an eternity, but then eventually he left, clamoring back down the stairs. I called my mother and told her about the incident, which prompted her to come home immediately. She seemed very freaked out when she got back. She ended up calling the police and would not let me listen to the conversation. We had to move out of that town a month later, and I didn't even get to finish my freshman year there. My mom didn't tell me until years later, but the man who came to the window, our neighbor, had actually been my mom's old employee. He'd been stealing tons of money from the hospital, along with other workers, so my mom told the company and they were fired. Worse yet, shortly after that, she began to receive death threats and was specifically told that they were going to take me and murder me if she did not give them their jobs back. She didn't tell me at the time, so I wouldn't be scared, which was probably a good thing, but it crosses my mind from time to time that if that man had decided to break the window and come inside, I could have been killed that night. A Broken Clock From Eye Doctor 78 When I was 22, I worked at this gas station a couple towns over from where I lived at the time. This happened in the 80s. The place had been around since the late 40s, but by the time I got there, it was old and dinky and rotting. Over the years, the neighborhood it was in had seen itself slowly fill up with the poor, gaining the reputation as the bad side of town. My boss warned me about that during my interview. He said the place had already been robbed three times in just that year. I told him I didn't care. I needed the money. He said there were plenty of other jobs on the other side of town who would love to hire a nice young guy like me. 
I said they would have to find someone else, because I didn't have a car, and I wasn't going to go all that way, just to make the same amount of money I could here. He said, okay, but he'd warned me. I was put on the night shift, nine o'clock to seven in the morning. Easy work. All I had to do was watch the register, maybe stock or rearrange the shelves and coolers or sweep here and there on occasion. But most of the time I just stood around, watching the little black and white TV they had in the corner behind the register. All the guff my boss had given me about danger and all that crap seemed useless. Hardly anyone ever caused any trouble. Hardly anybody ever even came here. Sure, I'd get a few tweakers who would come in and walk around the store like I was an idiot, trying to steal stuff, but they always backed off when I began monitoring them. Druggies are usually cowards around here, when you get down to it. There was, however, one night. It had been raining for three days straight, and most of the roads in and out of town were flooded. I wasn't even supposed to work that night, but the other guy, Zach, had called in. He said his driveway was blocked off and overflowing. So there I was on my day off, alone. The night was cold and wet and dragging on and on and on. Around two in the morning, this old guy walked in. I wish I could say my senses had been working that night, that I'd gotten a bad feeling about him right away, but I didn't. He just seemed like any old creep in that town. Kind of dirty looking, but harmless in a way. I never saw him try to pocket anything, even though he spent a good while looping the store, going up and down each aisle. He was friendly too. That was the strange part. I know it sounds funny when I say that, but anyone who has ever worked in retail can agree that most people just go in and out without so much as a hello or have a nice day. This guy, on the other hand, was a natural talker. He saw me watching the fight on TV, and that was a 10-minute conversation right there. He hated Muhammad Ali. I ignored him on that one. After that, he went off on Doritos, saying they were nasty, along with a whole bunch of other stuff in the store. Then he talked about hating the rain, spending a good 30 minutes filling me in on his leaky roof. I was getting tired. I asked him if he was going to buy anything, and that seemed to hit a nerve. His face grew cold and pale, and he stared at me for a few moments, like a statue never blinking. I was about ready to reach for the phone and call the cops, but he broke the tension with a smile. Never in my life had I been sickened by a smile, but that was my first. It was this bizarre plastic grin full of crooked yellow teeth, a grin that seemed phony, like it was his best try. He spoke again, and this time I got a nose full of rotting meat, smelled like it was two weeks old. You got a bathroom around here? We did, but for a second I thought about lying to him and saying no. Then I ran it through my head. I could see him losing it on me and maybe pulling out a knife or gun. I didn't feel like dying that night, so I shrugged and told him where the bathroom was. I was glad to be alone again. Hopefully he'd go and get out. A few cars pulled up then, and I went out to tell them our pumps were empty and to go to the Conoco a few blocks up the road. There were a few complaints, but most turned out to be understanding, and even went in to get snacks and beer, making small talk in the process. It made the time pass by faster. Before long, it was nearing five o'clock, and I was itching to go home. A loud bang from the other side of the store killed that dream in a heartbeat. The place was empty when it happened, and I could feel that silence, thick and unwavering, running up the back of my neck. I stood, thinking about what to do next. I never saw or heard that old man go out the door. I fought away my initial panic, but my heart, it wouldn't stop thumping. Animal instinct, I guess. Then I remembered. I swallowed the lump in my throat and approached the bathroom door. Locked, even though there was a big sign that said specifically not to lock the door. It had been put up there ever since my coworker Dennis caught a girl on the toilet with a needle in her arm. Plus, it was written in big red letters. So, obviously, 
The old geezer was either blind or hated rules. I knocked. Are you still in there? Nothing. I knocked again. Sir, are you okay? Once more, nothing. I felt a chill go through me. Just my luck, I thought. He'd probably pulled an Elvis and plopped dead right there on the toilet. And now it was me who was going to have to spend the whole morning dealing with the cops and paramedics, when I should be getting home to bed. I sighed. I went and got the bathroom key and jiggled the door open. What I stumbled upon stopped me dead in my tracks. Blood. There was nothing but blood. A big pool of it beside the toilet and smeared up the wall. But no body. Stupidly, I called out for him, but he obviously wasn't ever going to be there. I nearly fell over. I was so dizzy, like I was dreaming. I wished I was dreaming or hallucinating or something other than what was happening. There was a window in that bathroom, opened, and the trail of blood ending right at the sill. But it was so high. I couldn't imagine a man of his age having the strength to pull himself up all that way. He must be in the store still, I thought, roaming around on his tiptoes, maybe with a knife. Maybe this was his plan, mess with the kid before sticking him for good. I was trembling. Somehow I managed to control my breathing. I shut and locked that damn door. I got my pocket knife out, and every bit of my soul was screaming at me to ditch the whole scene, but still I searched the entire store, front to back, top to bottom, reminding myself that if I were to bolt, the only thing on the cop's mind would be me. However, not a soul was in the building except me. I grabbed the phone behind the register. I dialed my boss to see what he thought I should do. I was thinking of what to say, ready to hear my boss's tired voice answer, before noticing the line had been cut. My stomach sank. I'd spent my whole life watching movies and hearing about bad things happening to people in the middle of the night, but this, this was real. I locked the front door, then approached the back door, my knife ready. I pushed it open slow, the slowest I'd ever been, and I peeked out. All I saw was the trash can being overtaken by the river of rainwater flooding down the alleyway. I made sure both front and back doors were locked, then flipped over the closed sign. I returned to the bathroom and took a hard look at the mess I faced. I kept telling myself it wasn't real, trying to force any kind of logic onto the situation, but my eyes would not lie to me. They couldn't lie to me, and now what they were seeing was that blood getting cold and hardening to the floor. I don't know how long it took me to get it all mopped up. I was in a daze, and I kept looking over my shoulder, ready for the old man to leap out of some overlooked shadow, eyes wild and knife in hand, pouncing on me. Part of me prayed for just that, to get it all over and done with, so I didn't have to be afraid anymore. But no, I was all alone, the sun taking its sweet time to rise and pulling me out of this hellish night. I went back out into the alleyway, dumping the dirty blood water right there into the street, watching it run off past the trash can and into the storm drain. I knew it would mix up with that water to where you would never see the red in it, and it would flow far, far away. I bleached and squeezed that mop until it was back to its dirty gray glory. My wrists then were sore as hell. I was all done. The bathroom wasn't sparkling clean, but unless you had Superman vision or something, you couldn't even tell there had been a person in there, let alone blood. I was glad about that, yet paranoid. I remained rigid behind the register distracting myself with the TV until my shift was over. A little bit later, Annie, my coworker, came in for a shift change. I clocked out and walked about as fast as I could in the pouring rain, ignoring the friendly strangers offering me rides. Eventually, I caught the bus back to my town, got a seat all the way at the end. I was too tired and sick to sit beside anyone. I wanted to be alone for the rest of my life, 
In the days that followed, my sanity crumbled. I asked for day shifts, but even then, I was still gripped with a sickly fear that people, especially the police, would start asking around about that old man. I was paranoid that some phantom witness with selective sight had been in that store with me, had just seen me and only me working the mop and would go off telling everyone in the news about it, that that's all that people would think about that night. But nothing ever happened, and I think that was the worst part. The days went on like they always had. It was like the old man had never existed. I quit that place not too long after. I never went back to that town, never told anyone about what happened until now. It keeps me up at night. I wonder about that man, where he went, if anywhere. I wonder if he's dead or not. And when I do, all I see is that blood and me mopping it away, a scared little boy. I don't know if that means anything, but I do know that my habit of suppression about that night has broken me, and worse, my family. My ex-wife doesn't speak to me, and my two girls hardly ever do, unless it's a birthday. I blame that on my anger. Angry that I never got answers about that night. Angry that I ran away from those questions in the first place. Angry that I get to wake up for another day, and let's face it, that old man probably can't. I should have called the cops. They would have helped. I should have done anything other than what I chose to do. I chose to be a coward and forget about it. It's a burden I've carried all these years, and it's a burden I'll carry until I'm gone. Quick note before the episode begins. When sending us your story at eeriecast.com slash submit, please ask yourself if the story is scary before you type it. Please do not send us stories that are simply uncomfortable. For example, a story about a stranger trying to ask you out to lunch might be uncomfortable, but a story about a stranger stalking you into the alley and trying to stab you is scary. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? The strangest thing's been happening here at Dead and Roasted. An old man has been ordering a tall, hot Americano, but by the time I bring the order out, he's gone. Maybe the old man is asking for some kind of coffee beverage and not me with my uniform off. Nah, can't be. Anyway, welcome back to the break room, my friend. You're just in time for another one of my horrendous breaks. Today I've got stories of obsessed customers, security guard haunts, and hostages who lived to tell the tale. Enjoy. These are tales from the break room. How did she leave? From Sanderson 550. I took a security job while I was in college, since it was easy work and gave me plenty of time to complete assignments while getting paid. As a part-timer, I had a regular post, but I would also fill in at other sites for extra hours. One day I was asked if I could cover a call-in at a real estate office downtown. I agreed since it was third shift and the place had Wi-Fi. I arrived at around 8pm and relieved the supervisor who was covering until I got there. The buildings were old and three stories. I only had to monitor the real estate offices on the first floor. Piece of cake. At or around 2135, I heard typing. I saw one of the offices along the wall had a light on, but I didn't see or hear anyone come in. So I went to the office to find a young lady typing on an old style manual typewriter. I tapped on the doorframe and introduced myself. She stopped typing and smiled telling me she was just finishing up some things before she went on a trip. It was odd because she was somewhat dressed up. Not what I usually see when an employee comes in after hours to tie up loose ends. I asked for her name so I could log her presence and the encounter in my hourly report. She gave me the name of Elise Gumble. I thanked her and added that she should let me know when she leaves so I could log her exit too and that I would also escort her to her vehicle in the dark parking lot. She smiled and thanked me, and she even said I was a doll. I don't know why, but that just struck me as odd. So I went back to my schoolwork at one of the desks. 
A bit later, I went to the restroom and noticed Miss Gumbel's office light was out and the door was shut. I noted the time as about 22.55. I went to the exit to see if she was in the lot. However, I saw no car but my own. I simply assumed she had left. I noted her departure in my log and sat back down. At about 23.20, I was startled by the sound of typing again. I looked up and the office door was closed, but the light was on. How did she get back in without me knowing? More annoyed this time, I went to the office and knocked on the door. The typing stopped. Miss Gumble? I inquired through the door. There was no answer. So I opened the door and noticed something that made my hair stand on end. There before me was a modern office setup, complete with a computer monitor, keyboard, printer, and fluorescent lighting and a drop ceiling. And more important, no typewriter. No Miss Gumble. I looked around. I stepped back and called for her. There was no way she could have exited that office, just as there was no way she could have entered the building without me noticing. I called the dispatch over the radio. Then I wasn't sure what to tell them, so I asked them to call me at the site. Just then a supervisor called over the radio advising that he was in the vicinity and that he could stop by. A few minutes later, he arrived. After explaining the odd events that just transpired, he nodded and said, I'll be damned. He explained that the company just obtained this contract just over a year ago. The first guy who worked this site quit mid-shift with a similar story. The guy who replaced him left a day later, stating another similar story. But he came back and didn't have an issue until last night when he encountered Miss Gumble again and called it off, which then required my service tonight. Long story short, I did some investigating. Back in the 1920s, this building was a small textile factory. I also found a grave online for Elise Anna Gumbel, who died July 6th, 1925. She was just 27 years old. I couldn't find any other details. My best guess would be that she may have worked as a secretary or even in management at the textile plant. Given her age, she may have died tragically in an accident over the holiday. She did tell me she was going on a trip after all and it seems that she only makes her appearance around the first week of July. She's pleasant and friendly, but very unnerving for those unprepared for her late-night visit. Since then, I usually visit her grave and place a flower there for her. I let her know that if I ever work that location again, she's always welcome to visit. But since then, I graduated, and I found a career, and I never saw her again. Tag Ripper Tom from Archer About a decade ago, I was a young, newly married woman whose husband was away on deployment. During the time, I lived alone, so in order to make the days and months go by faster, I took on more shifts at my job and just worked as much as I could to stay busy. While working in a big department store, it wasn't difficult to find extra shifts. Every day, there was at least one person that called in sick or simply didn't show up. After a few months of filling in around the store, I made the move to a completely different department when a better position opened up. While I did enjoy my old team, our team leader was a walking disaster, and I just couldn't stand them anymore. They were the kind of boss that would criticize how we completed store tasks, like printing and signing merchandise, while not knowing how to operate the program that printed out our signs in the first place. When I began working in the men's department, I was really happy with the change. My old boss was way on the other side of the store, and my new department was close to the mall entrance. So when we had customer appreciation events, like handing out candy during Halloween or balloon making during the 4th of July, I was close to the excitement. Overall, my experience working with the customers in this department was more pleasant, not to mention easier than any other department I'd been in. So if someone was looking for a dress shirt for a wedding, I would pick out a few nice examples that were less formal, and even some trouser options that would complete the look. Living on Oahu, a lot of people attend events that require aloha attire. 
I think if you aren't used to navigating the bright and strange world of Hawaiian shirts, it can be intimidating and overwhelming. Another situation I enjoyed helping with was when families were shopping for a funeral in order to dress the deceased loved one. Sure, that sounds weird to hear, it sounds strange when I say it out loud, but there's something really rewarding in being able to help someone find a complete outfit to dress their dearly departed in. I remember one customer. She was an older woman who had mobility issues, so I had her sit by the cashier station and describe to me what she was looking for and what sizes she needed. I brought different options to her, and in the end, she quickly decided on a charcoal suit with a deep blue dress shirt, navy socks, and navy underwear. I'll never forget how thankful she was that everything was so fast and simple. Along with all the great customers, though, there was a handful of terrible ones. I think every store has their own set of terrible customers. The difference comes down to how the stores themselves choose to handle them. This customer, who I'll call Tom, was one of those cases where if the upper management or even loss prevention store security had stepped in sooner to handle him, I don't think he would have had the chance to harass almost all the women in the store. The first time I met Tom was in the suit section of our department. He was looking through a rack of clearance dress pants and asked for some assistance with finding his size. During the interaction, he told me that he was homeless and that he was looking for a nice shirt and slacks to go on job interviews in. Tom was a very tall and broad man in his late 50s, so I knew the size he was looking for was in a different area, the big and tall section. After we got there, he was able to find two pairs of dress slacks and a few shirts that were all on clearance. Tom was really happy with his purchase and I felt good about being able to help another customer. When he was leaving, Tom said that I was the best and that he'd look for me every time he needed help. He said it in such a positive manner that I didn't find it strange. It didn't feel strange or creepy at the time, just positive. About a week later, I saw a sticky note with Tom's name and phone number on the bulletin board we keep in the back. It wasn't unusual to take customers' phone numbers in order to call them back when we got a specific item back in stock. I asked the department manager about the note, and she said that Tom came in during the week looking for me but she ended up helping him for over an hour with dress slacks and shirts again. When I told her about the last purchase I helped him with, we just figured maybe he got the job he interviewed for, and he was now buying extra dress clothes since he knew they were on sale. I didn't think much about it until that weekend. On Sundays, I usually came in early to change all the signs in our department. This shift was special because it was 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. We got to leave early, but had to clock in three hours before the store opened and work without air conditioner. Around 9 a.m. when the store opened, I was double checking my signs when I noticed Tom walking in my direction. We made small talk for a few minutes until he asked me if there was anything new on clearance. I pointed him in the direction of some plain single color short sleeve t-shirts that had been reduced a second time. The brand was probably getting rid of that type of shirt because they'd gone down to about three bucks each. Tom seemed really happy with this and went through each color looking for his size. With only about 10 minutes left before I was able to clock out, I escorted Tom to the cash register and proceeded to check him out. Sometimes on busy mornings, it helped to waste a little time by jumping in with the cashiers and checking out a few customers. While I was scanning his shirts, Tom asked if I could double bag the shirts. He explained that the bags were really useful to have, and they also kept his clothes dry since he had some storage issues. Feeling great about helping Tom again, I folded the shirts he purchased and double-bagged them for him. No problem. The problem arrived when we were waiting for the machine to approve his credit card. While he looked down at the machine, he said, You know, you remind me of someone. Gosh, why can't I remember her name? Not really thinking about it, I just handed him his receipt and started to tell him to have a nice day when he interrupted me and said, Oh, Betty Boop, that's who it is. You remind me of Betty Boop. Oh, uh, that's interesting. I blurted out, feeling completely caught off guard. Yeah, did you know she was a sex symbol in the 30s? He added with a degree of huskiness that made me so uncomfortable that I said goodbye and just went to the back of the store to clock out. I told my department manager about it, and she said she'd keep tabs on him since it seemed like he was coming in often. 
I changed my schedule and forgot about Tom for a little while. Maybe a month later, I was standing in line buying rabbit food when I heard a familiar voice behind me say, you look different when you're not in your work clothes. It was Tom. Caught off guard, I really didn't know what to say, so I just replied with, yep, it's uh, my day off, and I turned back around. I quickly paid in cash and ran to my car. I know he wasn't following me, but I still took the long way home and cut through a lot of back roads along the way just in case. When my department and floor manager were talking about Tom a few days later, I brought up that I saw him outside of work and how weird it was. To their credit, they both took me aside and seriously asked me if I thought he was stalking me. And I don't believe that he was. It was weird that we were in the same checkout line, but other than being creepy, what else could be said of the guy? What else could I say he was guilty of? So I told my managers that I didn't want to help him when he came in. Then they scheduled me in the women's department for a few weeks. While I wish I could say that it ended there, it didn't. Working in the women's department was a short-term relief to a problem that was still ongoing. My department manager said that she was dealing with Tom when he came in to try to defuse his presence. After he had repeatedly gave her his number under the guise of checking in on inventory, he asked her for her personal number to contact her directly. When she told him that he could always reach her with the store number, he tried to file a complaint against her, saying that she had bad customer service. I think when Tom realized he wasn't getting as much attention as he used to, he decided to shift his tactics. Instead of asking a lot of questions about clothing items, he would take them into the fitting rooms and rip off all the tags, then stand in line to pay for them. By ripping off the tags, he ensured that the cashiers had a hard time scanning the clothes and had to call for clerks like me in order to find out the prices. Looking back on it now, I think he did this so more people had to help and tend to him when he was in the store. In one incident, when I was back working on the men's side, I had to price check a few belts that Tom was trying to purchase. Not wanting to go there in person, I called the cashier over the phone. She said that she had a customer with four belts and no tags, and that the customer said they're all on clearance. I checked on the belts she described to me and tried to handle the matter over the phone but it was beginning to escalate the longer I refused to walk there in person. So I called for a manager and then got the exact belt Tom was trying to buy and I brought it over to the cashier station. Tom was really upset when he saw me. He put it together that I was the person on the phone who obviously didn't want to be there in person. He started yelling. Oh, I see how it is. You and Cheryl playing games. You only want to talk to me and be nice to me when you're on the clock, huh? I see how it is. Cheryl is my department manager. Luckily for me, by this time, our store manager arrived, and I handed the whole situation over to him like a dirty diaper. The next morning before the store opened, we had a small floor meeting about what happened and the whole situation with Tom. It was there that I found out Tom liked to hang out in the shoe department as well and many of the shoe sales clerks had similar stories. And the cashiers that had to help Tom check out reported that he liked to chat them up too and tried to invite many of them to lunch. They only started to make complaints about him when he began to ask for their personal information. What resulted from this meeting was having the undercover security guards walk around the floor more often. I don't know if Tom picked up on this or not, but he broadened his scope to the rest of the store so no one could accuse him of targeting one particular person. Amongst other reasons, I quit that year. Even though I didn't work there anymore, I was still connected to my coworkers on Facebook where they could complain every few weeks about Tom. Even a year later, he was still roaming the different departments, trying to chat up female employees, making them uncomfortable, then getting upset when he was rejected. Before he finally disappeared, he had a big incident in the jewelry department. Apparently, he asked the associate there to show him various pieces of men's accessories, then tried to ask her which pieces she liked. Thinking he meant which pieces did she think would make a great gift, she pulled out a few rings and bracelets for him to look at. When she was trying to show him the different watch face sizes against her own wrist, he stopped her and complimented how nice her skin was and how she had the perfect hands to work in jewelry. 
that such nice hands deserve a nice watch like that, and that he could buy it for her if she wanted him to. My insides cringed when I heard about all that. I can't imagine how that woman felt put on the spot while she was just trying to do her job. From what I heard, the next associate put all the jewelry away, and when Tom started yelling, the store security called the police. I don't know what happened to Tom after that. Sometimes I wonder if he moved on to bothering the female associates in Macy's or maybe Target. Creepy Customer from Joey D. I was a 20 year old guy, a 6 foot 1 with dark hair and an average build. A few years back, I was working for a local convenience store in York, England to pay for my university rent and bills. Our store was the last one open that late, midnight, and on Fridays we would often get drunk customers on nights out, coming in five minutes before closing, taking their sweet ass time to leave, delaying our ability to close up shop and go home. One Friday I got to work at 4pm and half an hour into the shift, our store manager and staff supervisors went into a meeting in the tiny office at the back of the shop. I was restocking shelves when I heard the double bell for my colleague on the tills. A double bell is for a manager, and knowing they were stuck in a meeting, I went over to help, noticing there was just one customer at the tills. I also quickly noticed my colleague looked stressed. I walked up in front of the customer and asked if I could help. My coworker leaned closer and whispered that he didn't feel comfortable serving the customers, the guy was clearly drunk. He was trying to buy a large bottle of cheap wine, and you could definitely smell alcohol on him. I kindly explained to the customer that we were not able to serve him at this time. The guy stared into my eyes and quietly whispered, Please, please. I replied that we were not able to sell him alcohol at that time. After much awkward silence and eye contact, this guy just staring deadpan into my face, he grabbed the bottle of wine and swung at me, narrowly missing my head and bringing the bottle down hard on the baggage shelf. He hit it so hard he dented the part of the counter where people put their baskets full of shopping stuff. How the bottle didn't just break, I have no idea. But that could have been my head. I probably would have died, or at least be in a coma. My colleague on the till grabbed the bottle and pulled it away from him. The panic not quite having set in, I calmly repeated the man would need to leave. He storms off past me, and as I followed to make sure he left the store, he spun around asking if I was religious. He pointed a finger to my throat, saying the KKK would come after me. He then turned and walked out the store. As soon as he left, I started to feel sick. My legs were shaking. I laughed it off and went back to the shelf I was stacking. Shortly after, the manager and senior members of the team emerged from the back office, Upon telling them what happened, they said they already knew, as they had seen the events transpire through the store's CCTV camera. I asked them why they didn't come to help. They said they wanted to see what happened. Needless to say, I wasn't working there very long after that. We saw quite a few sites working late at night on a Friday in the busy city with two universities but nothing came close to nearly being knocked out or worse by an angry drunk wielding some cheap wine. Hostage Situation at Work From Nick F. This story took place about a decade ago in Glasgow, Scotland, specifically in a beauty salon in the city's West End. For obvious reasons, I won't reveal the name and location of the salon. However, it was late autumn, so the light faded early, and it was dark by about 5 p.m. My two friends, for the purpose of this story I'll call them Neelam and Aisha, were working one day, and were just about to close the salon for the evening. Suddenly, three masked men came in with plastic shopping bags. They said they were looking for the salon owner, and when they were told that she was not in the store that day, they closed down the shutters. Neelam was obviously scared, but also thought they seemed fairly amateurish and harmless, until they pulled out hammers and a roll of duct tape from the bag. They marched Neelam and Aisha to the back of the salon, where they proceeded to bind their hands behind their backs, then put tape over their mouths. 
In reality, the whole situation lasted for only about 10 minutes, but it felt so much longer as things looked as though they were beginning to turn more sinister. The men began smashing some of the inside of the store, using their hammers to break the cash register and also the phone. For whatever reason, they didn't actually steal anything. Then they decided to just leave while Neelam and Aisha were left out in the back of the store. After struggling for some time, they used a pair of hairdresser scissors to cut the tape from their wrists, and once they removed the tape from their mouths, they used their phones to call the police. Although they were unharmed, they both say this was the single most frightening thing to ever happen to them, and to this day, they do not know why those men wanted to see the owner so badly. They could guess it was something that was best being kept out of, so they quit the salon shortly after. As far as we know, the men were never caught. However, my friends did have to attend identity lineups, although they could never identify anyone, as the actual men had been wearing balaclavas during the incident. They were grateful the owner wasn't there that day, as they're certain the men had very bad intentions for her, and this scary situation could have been much, much worse. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Time for another break already. Good. I needed a moment for my 11th coffee of the day. You know if I don't get my 11th coffee, I get cranky. And the last time I got cranky... Well, let's just say that family of possums in the alley is still pretty mad. Anyway, today I've got some new and scary allegedly true stories for you, featuring terrifying things in retail, horse corrals, and assisted living centers. Enjoy these tales from the break room. And for the love of God, Gary, please hurry with that latte. Mysterious Woman from Vladimir I work third shift, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. as a housekeeper at an institute for the mentally and physically disabled. Our department is located at the far end of the building, past the backyard door, where we take the trash out. Before COVID, our work IDs acted as a key to unlock the doors after the scanner accepted them. Now the only way into the building is the main entrance. I believe it was mid-2017. I was moved to third shift, but during my second week on third shift, my first day of being alone, I gave myself an early break. I sat in our break room, scrolling through some social media app, when a woman burst into the room. Her hair was a mess, her clothes looked torn, and she looked terrified. I had never seen her before, and I wasn't sure if she was new or normally worked on third shift. When she caught her breath, she told me something that made my stomach turn. I just woke up in my car in the parking lot. I don't know where I am. Can you help me? She asked as she began tearing up. I was stunned into silence for a moment. I, uh, was it your car? I managed to ask. She shook her head. No, I don't own a car. I don't know whose it was. She was panicking now, and I'm trying not to panic too. Uh, how did you get inside? I asked, trying to calm myself. She walked me to the back door and just pointed. She had no badge though and the door was 100% locked, which I knew because I'd accidentally locked myself out earlier, and I had to walk to the main entrance just to get back in. She took me outside. When I told her the nearby street names, a few she recognized. She wanted me to show her how to get to the main street. However, when we were out there, she kept trying to get me to go to the parking lot. She wanted to show me the car she woke up in. I reassured her I believed her, and I didn't need to see the parking lot. I also didn't want to go there since it was closed off due to construction. As I walked her to the hill to go to the main road, I mentioned calling the cops. No, 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 no cops. She yelled at me. I dropped the subject, and I took her as far as I could go. She eventually stopped trying to get me to go to the parking lot, thanking me for helping her. She then went on her way. When she was out of earshot, I called security and told them what happened. 
One security guard came out and drove around to find her, but they couldn't find her. She was gone. He said there was no one walking around on the property or even the street below. He did, however, find the caution tape in the closed-off parking lot completely destroyed and evidence of a car having just been there. He then made a joke that disturbed me right to my core. Sounds like someone was trying to lure you somewhere and take you. Was I almost a victim of human trafficking? We never found out whose car was in the parking lot. We never found out who the woman was or how she vanished so fast. We never found out how she got into the building either. To this day, I think about her. Is she safe? Was the security guard's joke just a joke? Ghost in Assisted Living from KS. When I was 20 years old, I got a summer job working at an assisted living home. At the time, I needed hands-on patient experience for my degree. So without any credentials or formal training, I dove right in. This particular establishment was about 25 minutes away from my house. It was located in the more rural part of my county and brand spanking new. It was built on a property that had once been clay pits, so it was pretty much surrounded by nothing other than a small field with a small church and a graveyard across the street. I've always been the type to get spooked easily. I'm a lover of horror stories and I'm always letting my imagination run wild at the sound of every eerie creak and sight of every shadow. So working somewhere with that kind of setting led to many nights of me scaring myself. I would constantly jump out and scare my coworkers, and I would constantly say how this building and location would be a perfect landscape for a Texas Chainsaw Massacre-esque movie. But this particular incident occurred at one of those times when I wasn't reading too far into the sights and sounds of the building on second shift. To begin, my coworker and I had just finished passing medications. I'd say it was around 9.30 p.m., all of our residents were in the rooms or in bed, and we were winding down from the hectic day, getting ready to clean, do bed checks, and various other busy work until the shift was over at 11 p.m. However, we went into the main area of the building to take a quick break in two armchairs. As we were relaxing, I was facing my coworker and we were having a conversation. I remember her face going blank and serious suddenly. She was staring behind me then. At some point, I just said, Seriously, dude, you gotta cut that crap out right now. She then replied, That was weird. I could have sworn I saw someone walk down the hallway. At that point, we were spooked and decided to investigate. When we rounded the corner, there was no one there. Shocker. So at that point, we let rationality hit us and we decided to do a bed check on all the residents on that side. But everyone was safe and sound. Everyone was accounted for. However, when we got to an older gentleman's room near the middle of the hallway, he was still awake and reading in his chair facing the doorway. I knocked and he permitted me to enter, and as I entered, he asked me, What was Julie doing in the hallway? To which I answered, Julie, no, she's sleeping in her room. The man then said, oh, Weird. I could have sworn I just saw someone walking down the hall. They had a taller build and looked young, so I figured it was Julie. At this point, my coworker was standing next to me in the doorway and had heard enough of the conversation to understand that the man had shared her vision. She then told him what she'd seen, at which point he laughed it off and said, <laughs> Must be a ghost. You may think this is a boring and uneventful story, but it is true. I had another resident in that building who was within her final days, who told me, The people in the chairs won't stop staring at me. She then pointed to the two chairs for visitors in her room. Stories like these two make me wonder about trapped spirits in that place. Although the building was new, you never know what happened on the soil it stood on. 
A Retail Experience From Shattered Silent Soul A couple of years ago, I used to work at a gas station slash outdoor supply store that my father currently co-owns. I've had many brief but unsettling encounters while working there. For a bit of context, I'll say that at the time of the experience I wish to share, I was a female in my early 20s, somewhat tall but incredibly slim by nature, and my naturally light-colored hair often garnered a lot of unwanted attention from older men during my lifetime. As a summary, in my time working at the store, I was once asked by a customer to climb into the bed of his truck to help load some firewood back at his house. I was almost stalked by a mentally ill man who was actively stalking my younger female coworker and had once nearly attempted to steal a gun from the store while I wasn't there. And moreover, I've received countless lingering and vastly uncomfortable stares and inappropriate remarks from many other men in their 40s and above. But this one experience truly makes me glad I no longer work in retail. This worst encounter occurred during a spring. I was working late one day with an older female coworker. A slightly overweight man entered the store half an hour before closing and asked to have a small propane cylinder filled. That was also a service we provided. My coworker absolutely hated filling the propane tanks, but I didn't mind it. So I said that I'd do it while she took care of another customer who had approached the counter. As such, I donned the protective gloves and walked outside with the man. The massive propane reservoir we had was around the side of the station. It was still in view of the parking lot, but not any of the store windows or security cameras. And there was only a dim overhead light illuminating the dusk around us. Effectively, we were invisible to anyone, not directly in front of us, in the otherwise empty parking lot. Once he placed his cylinder onto the platform, I started through the standard routine motions. The man began to make typical small talk. As usual, I was polite like any customer service employee would be, but I started getting an off feeling inside my gut. Something about the man set my anxiety off, and I didn't fully know why, until he suddenly began to ask me the dreaded personal questions everyone knows. So how old are you? I felt my heart drop and thought to myself, oh god, please don't do this. But I maintained my customer service smile and replied as casually as possible. Old enough to carry. I was actually open carrying a pistol at the time, something highly encouraged by my gun-loving father. However, it was also a great deterrent for some of the creeps who came into the store, and I hoped it would deter any further unwanted advances by the man. Honestly, I believe to this day that the fact I had that gun on my person is what most likely saved me from something truly awful occurring to me that night. Back to the story itself. I unfortunately had to bend over to properly hook up the transfer nozzle between the two propane tanks to give the man his gas. As such, I positioned myself so that my side faced him. Without even trying to be subtle, this at least 50-year-old man sidestepped so that he was directly behind me and only a couple of feet away. Simultaneously, he asked me if I lived in the area and which school I went to, if I went to college. My anxiety spiked. This man was suddenly out of my field of view, and he clearly was not simply trying to be friendly. Quickly, I sidestepped again, rounding his propane tank while I continued screwing the hose into place so that I was somewhat facing him again. Despite my adrenaline beginning to pump, I somehow outwardly maintained my cool. I don't go to college anymore. I don't live around here. Again, he abruptly sidestepped so that he was directly behind me, gradually inching closer as well. Oh, so where do you live? Once again, I immediately moved to the opposite direction to keep him in my periphery while I worked. All the while, it's getting darker out by the minute with a singular streetlight illuminating the area. There's no one else around either, not even another vehicle in the parking lot. It was just us. If the man wanted to do anything to me, no one would have witnessed it. My heart was racing. Well, uh, I live about a half hour from here with my parents, I said in return, trying to work faster. We actually went back and forth for a bit longer, awkwardly sidestepping in what was basically a back alley 
while I checked the safety of the tanks and tried to keep this creep within my field of vision. All the while, he tried to move closer and remain directly behind me no matter where I moved. We were basically dancing in the dusk air, but I didn't want to be a part of that repugnant waltz. Finally, I got the two tanks properly hooked up to each other. I stepped back while it loudly went to work. I then looked directly at the man for the first time since leaving the building. He was staring me dead in the eye now with the creepiest, widest smile I've seen to this day. Without breaking eye contact, he took a step forward and spoke. It's a good thing you got that gun on you right now. It gets dangerous at night, you know. At the time, I was openly carrying a 9mm pistol. In that moment, I was immeasurably thankful that my dad had previously suggested I have it during late nights. Taking a small step back and against a concrete post, I forced a smile. Yeah, it's good for protection. Maybe I could show you my gun sometime, sweetheart. He stole another step towards me, standing a mere foot from my face. I wanted to simultaneously gag and run as my anxiety shot through the roof. But stupidly, I decided being compliant to my job was more important. I didn't want him to steal the propane and subsequently harm my father's business. So I just took another step back, swerving around the post, and I said nothing. Thankfully, his propane tank filled up only a few seconds later, and the machine shut itself off as it was meant to. Ready to run away, I unhooked that little cylinder so fast I would have made Usain Bolt envious, and by the grace of the universe, another car pulled into the parking lot right next to us at the same time. Their headlights landed directly onto both the man and myself. Instantly, he stepped back a couple of feet and actually began freaking whistling like a stereotypical, I'm not doing anything suspicious, character. Silently thanking my impromptu heroes in the car, I calculated the propane's cost, then walked back into the store with the man following behind me. Thankfully, the couple from the car also followed us inside, and the man kept his distance as we walked. Once inside, I told my coworker what his propane cost was, and I immediately went to the back to calm down while she handled the transaction. Overall, the entire encounter lasted only a few minutes, but with the way he acted, the blatantly inappropriate questions he asked me, and that predatory smile, it honestly felt much longer. Thankfully, he never actually touched me during the whole ordeal, and I visibly possessed a weapon. But given the other circumstances of the environment, time of day, and the fact that we were alone outside until that couple pulled up, things could have easily gone much worse, and likely would have. I truly believe that man harbored malicious intentions, and that he would have acted upon his thoughts had I not kept a gun on my person, or if that couple had not pulled into the lot and parked right where they had, the moment they had. Moral of the story Always keep a method of self-defense on you, especially if you work a customer service job. There will always be people with ill intent to encounter, but your protection is worth so much more than any job. The Mustang Creeper From Rockin' JSB Customs I grew up in Utah, spending some of my life on a reservation. My parents used to tell me stories of creatures that can't be explained by science. They also raised me around horses, especially mustangs. This gave me a love for the wild herds of horses. I worked myself through college and finally landed my dream job with the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM. At the time of this encounter, I'd been working for the corrals in an undisclosed area for three years. One night, I was covering a shift for a coworker. I'd also worked a partial shift during the day that day. You could say I was a bit sleep deprived. My job that night was to check the pins and patrol the area. We had had threats from a group of local PETA members, so patrol was extremely important for the safety of the horses. I saddled up my personal mare that had done this several times and enjoyed our night rides. We had been riding for about four to five hours by then, taking a few breaks here and there for snacks and water. The night was oddly hot for the area we were in, but the sky was absolutely beautiful. 
The moon was so bright in the sky that even if I didn't have a large flashlight, I could see several yards ahead of me pretty well. In the distance, you could hear a few of the owls making noise and see some of the local wildlife walking in the woods. At that moment, I stopped my mare for a quick break. Before long, I'd caught myself daydreaming for a while. But that didn't last too long. Because suddenly, I saw a flash of a blur running across my flashlight's beam. I blinked a few times, trying to determine if it was my eyes or my brain lacking sleep. I tried to look for the blur to ease my troubled mind. I lay my legs into the mare, but she refused forward motion. She instead kept trying to roll back on her hocks, starting to snort deep guttural sounds. Her ears were pinned tight to the back of her head. This was so out of her character. She was the type of horse that had been there and done that. Nothing scared her. She would even take on a bear to protect me. I got her settled down and decided I'm going to step off her and walk her back for a break. When both my feet hit the ground, she spun around, ripping the letdown rope out of my hand. I tried to chase after her, when suddenly a deformed-looking Mustang shape on the horizon stopped me in my tracks. The silhouette of this Mustang seemed normal until I looked closer. The head, neck, and barrel looked normal, but the legs and height were wrong. The front legs seemed to bend backwards towards the hind legs, making an almost 45 degree angle. The back legs seemed to be almost double the length of the front legs. They were almost completely straight. The hip was almost a foot taller than the shoulder of the creature. I tried to look away, but it was as if my eyes were being forced not to move. My next decision was to start walking backwards towards the corral. I was moving pretty fast backwards, but the weight of my legs seemed to get heavier and my skin soon felt as if ice was starting to encase me. Then I completely stopped. The fear in my mind kept telling me to fight it, to run. I thought, I'm gonna die out here. I don't want to die yet. The cold around my legs got worse. I forced myself to break eye contact from the beast, and I looked down. The moment I looked down, I saw there was no ice at all on my body, even though my skin felt completely frozen. I looked up again once I heard the sound of hooves beating down on the ground and getting louder. I looked to where I thought the hoof sound was coming from, but there was nothing there. The creature I'd seen before was gone. Suddenly, the sound stopped. I looked around for a moment, slowly the heat returning to my legs. Without a second thought, I ran. I was still a far distance from the corrals. I prayed my mare would show up and rescue me. After all, I'm not the running type. I made it about halfway to the corral. I stopped cold in my tracks. The sound of multiple women's voices screaming erupted around me, shaking the very ground beneath me. Before I could move again, I heard a deep voice say, Return my herd. My heart practically imploded then. I began to run, my legs moving faster than I ever thought they could. I reached the first set of pins and began my search for my mare. I was willing to allow her to run away as long as I could go with her. After a few minutes, I found her between two buildings. She was quivering like a tree in a plains windstorm. I grabbed a hold of her lead and I tried to get her out. But she became violent, she struck out at me, with the intention of not moving from her hiding spot. If she felt safe there, I would just leave her there then. I then walked to the camera monitor shack to speak with my coworker about the things I'd seen out there. When I walked in, I saw my coworker shaking like the mare outside. He was watching a small looping section of the video by the first set of pins. I walked up behind him to watch the loop. It was a 10 second clip of me walking into the first alleyway. It wasn't me that had him shaking, it was the man that stood behind me and the black aura-like ring around him. The man stood about eight feet to nine feet tall and he seemed to walk with backwards bending legs. He was wrapped in dark colored fur and a horse head sat on top of his head. Once I made it to the first set of pins with horses in them, 
he seemed to turn and melt into the pen. I pushed my coworker off to the side and pulled up the other camera that pointed straight at the pen. He disappeared. That man, creature, thing, it just freaking disappeared. The only thing I could see was the few young horses freaking out and slamming themselves against the back of the pen. I stayed in that shack for the rest of the night, only leaving to check my mare a few times. When the sun rose, I went out and my mare was waiting by the shack door. I loaded her up and made my mind up about the job. I turned my resignation into my boss that morning. I never looked back. About three days after I left, a few of those young Mustangs went missing. The corral blamed PETA, but my coworker, who had seen the camera too, said it was that man. After that, the horse-like entity has only been seen a few times, only on bright, moonlit nights. Tales from the Break Room is a horror podcast about scary work stories. Stories are written and sent to us by listeners. If you have an allegedly true and scary story relating to work and want to hear it narrated, share it with us at eeriecast.com slash submit. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? It just won't stop raining, will it? You know, I usually love the rain, but when you've got to deal with customers with varying amounts of hair and sometimes even fur, the place begins to take on a certain smell. Believe me, you don't want a coffee shop to be boggy and musky. Well, luckily I won't have to deal with that for another half hour, because it's my break time, and we both know what that means. New and allegedly true work-related horror stories that I've heard around the grapevine. This time I've got three stories all dealing with haunted workplaces. So have your two weeks notice ready to go just in case. These are tales from the break room. And for the love of Java, y'all better start sending me more stories about horrifying people encounters. I think these ghosts are starting to haunt the place. Mr. M's Ghost Buddies From Shiro I used to work for this company, however, because of the pandemic, I was let go. It was a relatively known company, so I won't name it here. However, I will mention that the US branch is the smallest branch. Due to the lack of staff, most of the workers had to fulfill a bunch of different roles and perform different tasks. For me, not only did I have my normal office work, I would also need to work in the warehouse. I didn't mind this, as it's relatively light carrying and packing. It was better than dealing with angry phone calls or pointless meetings. When I started working there, I always got the odd feeling that I was being watched whenever I was working in the office. It was a much stronger feeling when I would be doing the packing in the warehouse. I would often turn around and see nobody there, or things that I was just using would often be in a different spot than I left them. I am a pretty forgetful and clumsy person, so I just chalked it up to me forgetting where I put my things. One day during the summer, I was doing the normal packing for the month when I got the feeling of being watched again. I turned around, and this time I saw a little boy staring at me from behind some boxes. I clearly remember him having some sort of a bowl cut and big eyes just staring at me for a few seconds before moving back behind the boxes. I thought it was weird a kid would be there, but I figured our landlord, who was right next door to our office, brought his son with him to work that day. I walked to the back of the warehouse where I saw the kid, but I found nothing. As dumb as this sounds, I figured he gave me the slip and just went back to work. Later on that day, I saw my landlord walking around outside. I asked him if he brought his son over today. You guessed it, he hadn't. I shrugged it off and figured I just needed a break. A few weeks later, we were closing up the office and my manager was locking up. I'd forgotten my lunch bag on the second floor break room so I ran up to get it. After I took it out of the refrigerator, I heard a groaning and I felt a strong sense of anger behind me. I turned around and I saw a figure of what looked to be a woman. Her arms were straight down and her hands were in tight fists. She groaned angrily as if I was not supposed to be there. I bolted out of the room as fast as I could. 
My manager asked me what was wrong, joking that she knew I wanted to go home but I didn't have to run that fast. I said I'd seen a ghost, so I'd run out of the room as fast as I could. My other coworker there said I was lying, but my manager stopped him. She admitted that the office supposedly was haunted, but only relatively recently. When we asked her what she meant by that, she said one of our former presidents, let's call him Mr. M, had seemingly brought back some ghosts with him during his last business trip to Mexico. Mr. M was a very fun individual, often caught partying and living life to its fullest, despite being a middle-aged Japanese man. I've met him a few times prior to being hired, and he was always full of smiles. It actually wouldn't surprise me if on one of his business trips to Mexico, he partied a little too hard and did something he wasn't supposed to that caused these spirits to follow him back. Although I said he was our former president, nothing bad happened to him. His visa simply expired and he had to go back to Japan. I asked my manager what kind of ghosts did he bring back. She told me it was a little boy and a woman. My eyes went wide. I confessed that I'd seen both of them. She just casually shrugged and said, yeah, it happens. After that, I had a few run-ins with both of the spirits. The boy was harmless, often just watching me work, like a child watching his parent working. The woman never really got any friendlier, and when I felt her presence, I simply stopped what I was doing and walked out of the room. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, I was let go, so I never got the chance to say goodbye to them. However, to this day, I still wonder what Mr. M did that caused him to have two ghosts follow him back to our office. Previous Owner From Stay 0227 My husband and I moved to a small town in Georgia. We purchased a building that we were planning to use as a body shop. The building was in bad shape. It needed to have the roof redone. The windows, electric wiring, and doors needed replaced too. Much more work needed done, but it was still usable. We'd used all our savings to purchase the building, and we were new in town, so we didn't have many customers, as people in small towns don't just trust strangers easily and right away. My husband would go really early in the mornings to do some work to the building since we couldn't really afford to hire anyone. He would go early to try to work on the building himself from about 5 to 8, then work on the few customers we had during the day. The weird things in the building started small. He would tell me that he would hear some noises around the building, but didn't think too much of it. Sometimes he would leave tools in one place and he'd find them somewhere else. One time he was working late on one of his personal vehicles. He would buy a car or two sometimes and fix it up and resell it. All of a sudden, the headlights from a vehicle turned on. At this point, he was kind of tired, so he just got the heck out. He closed up and left. Now, I would often go with him to help out, with whatever was needed. On that day, I was alone sweeping and cleaning around, when all of a sudden, the toilet seat slammed loudly. I ran to check the bathroom. The toilet seat was up, and no one was in there. I was alone. This scared me so much, I stayed outside until my husband came back. I know you might think it was no big deal, but the place itself was pretty spooky and dark. You would always feel watched or someone behind you. We talked to people that had known the previous owner, and we were told that not many people lasted in this place. We also found out that the original owner that built the place was a body shop man like my husband. The guy had a pilot's license and died when he crashed his personal plane. The last two incidents made us finally do something about it. One night, my husband was working late again. He was under a car when a wrench was thrown at him. It landed inches near his arm. He lost it, telling the entity to stop or come out and confront him face to face. He got so angry and started yelling at whatever or whoever through the wrench but everything remained quiet. He turned off the lights and locked up and went home. All of these things happened often, things being misplaced, cars' headlights coming on by themselves, seeing shadows or hearing noises. It all became almost routine. The final major event that happened that finally pushed us over the edge was the one time when I was again alone. 
We had some people break in once, so we decided to keep a dog to guard the place. We had him tied up during the day and let him loose during the night. Now you need to know the shop is pretty big. At one side, there's a cement slab with a grate in the center. That's where we washed cars after they've been painted. We had a car ready and my husband had gone down to buy wax. I was about to go wash the car before he got back. Then the dog caught my attention because he was staring at something. Whatever it was, he was trying to get to it. He repeatedly and insistently pulled on his leash. When that didn't work, he began barking his head off. I ignored him, telling him to shush. Since I didn't see anything weird, I just figured it was a mouse or a frog, since the frogs would get in through the grate. I stepped in front of the car and was about to turn the water on when I saw a black something that was at the corner where the dog was barking at. This black something looked like dark smoke. It came out of the corner, stretched, and started moving towards me for a moment. I moved back because for some reason I thought it was a snake, since it was long and black and moving like a snake towards me. After I jumped back, this smoke thing moved into the grate. This scared me bad enough I started to shake. So I turned the water on and just aimed it towards the grate on the floor. My husband came in and I explained what had happened. That day we decided to go to a botanica a botanica, a place where you can find candles, herbs, charms, and other things for spiritual purposes. We asked a santero what we could do. A santero is a sort of priest. We explained the things that were going on. He said we could talk to the spirit and cleanse the whole building with white sage. He also gave us some mixture he prepared for us, telling us to sprinkle it all around the body shop. The following day after closing for the day, before we went home, we sprinkled the mixture and we turned off all the lights, save for one. We sat on the floor and just stared, talking. It went something like this. My husband said, Look, this is no longer your place. I bought it and look at it. It needs repairs and I'm doing just that. If you built this place, do you really want it to fall down? It's being put to work again and it's again a body shop. I don't want you to leave if you want to stay, you're welcome. Just don't throw things and don't scare us. I just want to make a life for myself and my family. When he finished, I said something too. We're going to cleanse this place to have any bad energies out of it. But you're welcome to stay. I want you to stay so you can see this place be as it used to be. After that, we proceeded to burn the sage we'd gotten. It may be hard to believe, but the next day felt better. It felt lighter. All the strange noises had stopped. We would see a shadow once in a while, but nothing sudden. After that, things did get better. Business got better too. We redid the roof and electric, and the place is almost as it was. On one occasion, my husband had to repair a car, but for some reason it wasn't going well. Parts weren't fitting right. He was frustrated and irritated, so he closed the shop and he went home. That night, he had a dream where someone told him exactly what to do to make the parts fit right. The next morning, he got to the shop and did what he dreamed about. Just like that, everything fit just as it should. It's happened again, too. Whenever he has a problem and can't find the solution, he asks out loud, and sometimes ideas or dreams just come. I have a feeling that he's getting help from the previous owner, so I'm guessing he's finally warming up to us. Ice cream, more like I scream, from Eden. My very first job was at a local ice cream and water ice store. Even though it's been more than 10 years, I'll never forget that job. I think I'd just turned 15 years old when I started. It was a seasonal job for the late spring and summer, which was perfect because I was in high school and tended to be busy in the fall doing theater productions. The place was a small ice cream shop located in a plaza with a local grocery store. It was the kind of ice cream shop where you would walk up to the window to order. There was no inside area for customers, just a few wooden benches outside the window to sit and eat your frozen treats. Since it was a small place, there weren't many employees. When I was hired, there was myself, three other girls about my age, a manager who was a little older than me, and the owner. 
The first summer I worked there, it was mainly myself and the owner there alone. Usually, I worked the opening shift 11am to 4pm. The owner at the time was a guy in his early to mid-30s. He usually stayed in the office, meaning it was just me up front with the customers. I had no problem with this. I would bring a boombox, yes, a boombox. It was the early 2000s after all. And I would play my favorite Broadway CDs or Disney classics to sing along to between customers. Honestly, I enjoyed working there, and I didn't notice anything weird about my workplace. That is, until I worked my first closing shift. It was midsummer, and one of the girls who usually worked the night shift had called out of work on a Saturday. We were usually quite busy on a Saturday night, as the plaza was located directly across from a skate park that was the popular teen hangout in the small town. Really, you either hung out at the skate park or in the parking lot of the plaza. Anyway, they were expecting a big crowd, so of course I was called in for the 4pm to 10pm shift. Instead of being there with the owner, I would be there with the manager. We'll call her Sarah. Sarah was maybe two years older than me. I'd seen her around the store from time to time, but I'd never worked directly with her. Truthfully, I was a little nervous, because I found it was hard for me to get along with other girls. Plus, I had just moved to this town earlier in the year after growing up in a big city, and I didn't have many friends. I quickly realized I had nothing to worry about. Sarah was so cool. That's literally the only way I could describe her. She had a nose ring, which wasn't popular back then, a bunch of ear piercings, brown hair with bright red tips, and even a tattoo. We bonded pretty quickly, within the first hour or two of the shift. She told me about wanting to go to college for criminology, and talked about her fascination with serial killers and true crime. Before long, the shop was pretty crowded, as most Saturdays were. However, as it got darker, the customers dwindled. The small town had a curfew for teenagers. They couldn't be out in the streets or parks past 10 p.m., so oftentimes, they would leave early to go hang out at someone's house, or something like that. The ice cream shop closed at 9 p.m., and that gave the closing crew an hour to clean and lock up. Having never worked a closing shift before, at some point during the shift, Sarah gave me a rundown of what we needed to do to get out on time. When we closed, I went to the back to retrieve the broom so that I could start to sweep. Now, the inside of the store was set up like this. First, there was the storefront, with the horizontal freezers that contained the tubs of water ice, the soft serve ice cream machines, milkshake blenders, soft pretzel display, topping display, and windows for customers to order from. Secondly was the back area, where we had the walk-in freezer, large fridge, pretzel oven, microwave, and water ice making machines. There was a glass side door there that led to the outside. And thirdly, we had the back hallways, two hallways that connected to the back area. One led to the small bathroom and the office, and the other led to the back door that went outside to where the dumpsters were. The one that led to the back door is where all the brooms, mops, and cleaning supplies were kept. That's where I went. The brooms were hanging on the wall by these tight clips you had to undo to get them down. As I made my way down the hallway, I watched as one of the brooms slowly unclipped itself. It was now in the air in front of me, and it stayed there for a few seconds before finally falling to the ground. The handle lay closest to me. I had watched it happen with wide eyes. I didn't even know what to do. It took me a minute, but I grabbed the broom and booked it to the storefront. Sarah was there putting lids on the tubs of water ice. She noticed that I was out of breath. You all right? She asked. I, the broom, it, I panted. It unclipped itself. Sarah finished my sentence. We stared at each other making eye contact for a few seconds. Look, she sighed. This kind of thing happens a lot here during the night shift. I can tell you more about it, but we should finish cleaning first. All I could do was nod. We sped through the cleaning. I'd always been good at cleaning during the day, and this was not really all that different. At the end of cleaning, we gathered all the trash bags and put them in the hallway near the back door. Then we turned off all the lights. The last thing that needed to be done was count up the registers. That was something I didn't have any experience with, so Sarah invited me into the back office with her so that I could see how it was done. Sarah sat at the wooden desk in a black computer chair, and I sat on a metal folding chair in the corner of the office. 
I couldn't help but glance up at the screens on the upper part of the desk that showed the camera feed. One camera was on the storefront, and the other two were in the back area pointed down both hallways. It wasn't great quality, but I could see Sarah and I inside the office door on the camera because the light was on. She laid the trays from the register out in front of herself, then she opened the big black safe next to the desk. As she started counting up the trays, she let out a deep breath. All right, she said. I assume you still want to know about what goes on here. I gulped, but nodded. Sarah bit her lip for a second. She peeked outside of the office, then slowly closed the door, locking it with the simple doorknob lock. A few years ago, this was a different ice cream shop, she began to say in a quiet voice. You wouldn't have known that since you're new in town, but it was owned by an older man and lady who had a son. The son worked as a manager here, and when he was 21, his parents found him in this very office. He had put a gun inside his mouth and pulled the trigger. He killed himself right here in this office. I felt my heart racing in my chest. So what you're saying is that the ice cream shop is haunted by that guy. Sarah slowly nodded. Usually he tries to help, like when the brooms come flying off the walls, but sometimes he likes to pull pranks on us. What do you mean by pranks? I asked. Well, Sarah started but then stopped. She was staring at the camera screens, eyes wide. I looked up and my eyes got wide as well. The camera, which pointed down the other hallway, was capturing a dark, shadowy figure of a man, which was illuminated by the red exit sign above the back door. Uh, like that, Sarah said. That's the door we have to go out later. When I blinked, the figure was gone. Before I could really process what was happening, there was a loud knock on the office door. Sarah and I were both startled and yelped. The doorknob began to twist and turn, but it was locked, so it wasn't going to open. I'm trying to count the registers, Sarah said. We're almost done. The doorknob stopped twisting. It must be getting closer to ten, she said quietly to me. Sarah quickly began to count the register trays again. As soon as she got them counted, she shoved the money in the safe and closed it. Come on, let's try to get out quick, she said. What'll we do if he's out there? I asked. He won't be, you know, probably. She flung open the office door. I clung to her arm as we made our way over to the side door. Sarah made sure it was locked. Then we went to the trash bags on the floor. We both grabbed as many as we could. We did not want to have to make a second trip. Then we booked it down the hallway and ran out the back door. I dropped the bags when I got outside and sunk down to the pavement. I glanced around, realizing we were in the back alley behind the plaza. There was a big green dumpster in front of me. Never had I been so glad to be in a creepy back alleyway. I let out a sigh of relief. Sorry, he's usually not so active. It must be because you're new, Sarah said, placing the trash bags one by one in the dumpster. To be honest, this had not been the first experience I'd ever had with a ghost. The house I had grown up in, in the city, was old and it was haunted. But since moving to this small town, I had finally got some peace. A break from any ghosts until now. I never really expected to see something like that at the ice cream shop I worked at. As the summer went on, I worked only a few other night shifts with Sarah. Most of them were relatively quiet, just small things here and there, like brooms unclipping or mop buckets rolling around. Eventually, fall came around and the ice cream shop closed for the season. By the time the next summer had come around, I was already invited back to the ice cream shop. That summer, I was going to be made a manager. Sarah chose not to return. She wanted that summer to herself before college. She had been accepted to a really good school in Washington, D.C. to study criminology. So, I would take over the position. This meant I'd be working the night shift a lot more. To be honest, at first, it wasn't that bad. A close friend of mine, who we'll call Marie, started working at the ice cream shop too. Most night shifts, it was me and her. Now, there were some times I'd be asked to work double shifts, both opening and closing the store. Yeah, I was a miner working way more hours than I should have, 
but it was a small ice cream shop and no one cared in the early 2000s. One day I'd been at the ice cream shop all day. It had been raining the whole afternoon. Rain means slow business for an ice cream shop. Usually only one girl would work all day and night when it rains. Since I was the manager now, I was that girl. Begrudgingly, I called Marie on the corded landline phone and told her she didn't need to come in that night. After giving her the night off, I plugged in my boombox and got to work. Believe it or not, I had a lot of responsibilities as a manager, even though I was young. One of my many tasks was to take care of the ice buildup on the insides of the horizontal freezers. Once a week, I'd have to remove the tubs of water ice and use a metal scraper to remove all the ice that built up on the inner walls of the freezer. I had begun to scrape the freezer when I heard a noise in the back. I sighed. I didn't want to investigate, but I knew it would be better if I did, so I put the metal scraper down and walked into the back area. I could already see that the broom was lying on the floor in the hallway near the back door. I picked up the broom. Yeah, I know, I said out loud. I'm gonna sweep, but I have to finish the freezer. I took the broom up front with me. I placed it, leaning against the ice cream machine, and bent over the horizontal freezer again. I stopped and stared. On the wall of the freezer, there was a large handprint, way too big to be my hand. As I stared at it, the boombox began skipping. I blinked quickly. Grabbing the scraper, I scraped away the handprint. Then I went to the back and I slapped the boombox, trying to get it to stop skipping. But it wouldn't stop so I had to unplug it. I tried not to think about it or say anything about it as the rain picked up and was now loudly hitting the roof of the ice cream store. But I had decided I would be calling Marie again. I took out my cell phone, I think it was one of those early androids with the touchscreen, and I called Marie. Luckily, she agreed to come in, even after I had given her the night off. She lived close by and walked over as soon as she could. I was so grateful for her company. Now that she could watch the storefront, I could complete most of my management responsibilities. The rest of the evening was quiet. Honestly, a little too quiet, considering what had happened earlier. When it came time to close up shop, we went about doing the closing tasks. Marie lifted a tub of extra water ice to put it in the walk-in freezer, then went into the back as I began to clean the ice cream machine. About ten minutes went by, and I realized I hadn't seen Marie in a bit. I went into the back to check on her. I couldn't find her in the bathroom, the office, or in the other hallway near the cleaning supplies. Marie? I called loudly. As soon as I said her name, there was a pounding on the walk-in freezer door. I rushed over and opened it. Marie practically fell out of the freezer. She said, Sorry, I, I didn't know the freezer locked. She was shivering. I must have looked freaked out, because she started to look freaked out. What? She asked me. The freezer does lock, I started, but it locks from the inside. I stepped inside the freezer and showed her how it locked from the inside. I believe this was so, if the ice cream store was robbed, you could take shelter in the freezer and lock it from the inside. I don't know for sure, but that's what I always assumed. I, I swear though, Marie told me. I, I couldn't open the door. I really couldn't. I believe you, I assured her. Then I sighed. This kind of thing happens a lot here during the night shift. I can tell you more about it, but we should finish cleaning first. I quoted Sarah exactly. Since I was the manager now, the responsibility of explaining the history of the ice cream shop had fallen upon me. I ended up working for that ice cream shop for a total of six summers as a manager. Today, that ice cream shop is a different business completely. When I still lived in that area, I would always pass by and wonder if he was still there. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an eerie cast network original podcast 
hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter, at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com.